This week I read a story that takes us back to the year 1865. The brutal civil war that had ravaged our country had just come to an end. And if our national pain could get any deeper, well, it does. It plummets, in fact, as President Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Well, Lincoln's body was carried from Washington to Illinois for burial. And we are told as it was passing through Albany, being carried through the street, there was an African-American woman standing on a curb with her little son amongst the crowds that have gathered to show respect. And she grabbed her son's hand, she hoisted him up above her shoulders, got him on top of her, and she son, said, son, take a look. He died for you. Son, take a look at him. He died for you. I thought that was a touching story from history and very much what we find in the 52nd and 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is going to say to us today, take a look. Jesus died for you. Jesus rose again for you. But here's the shocking thing. Isaiah is in the Older Testament. In other words, these words that we're about to read were written many years before Jesus ever entered the world, came, died, and rose again. And yet, men like the church father Augustine have said that this passage is not just a prophecy. This is a gospel message. When we read the words that we're going to consider this morning, it's like we're standing at the foot of Calvary, of Golgotha, and we're looking at the cross, and we're seeing the tomb, and then the fact that there's a vacancy sign because the tomb is not inhabited anymore. Jesus has conquered death. Yet the words are written 700 years before. The Protestant reformer Martin Luther said this about Isaiah 53. He said the suffering of Jesus is described so clearly here that none of the New Testament evangelists, except John, give a better presentation. He said all scripture scarcely has a passage equal to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Now this morning, we are going to do a flyover. I mean, I have preached through this before many years ago, almost 10 years back, and I think we took eight weeks going through this section. Don't worry, I know there's a ham awaiting you, or something else. We're not going to be here for hours, but we are going to spend a few minutes together, and I want us to see the beautiful gospel that God promised of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus 700 years before. Now, as I begin to read in a moment, I want to point out something. In chapter 52, verses 13 to 15, the speaker is God. In other words, God is saying these words to us. But when then when we get to chapter 53, verses 1 through 11, the speaker changes. No more is it God speaking to us. It is the people of God. It is God's Israel. It is everyone who has seen Jesus and been changed by Jesus speaking and confessing. If you're a Christian today, this is your confession back to God. And then at the end of verses 11 and then 12 of chapter 53, God has the final word about his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's hear together God's word beginning in verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Remember, God saying these words. Just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So he shall sprinkle many nations, kings shall shut their mouth at him, for what had not been told them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Now as we pick into chapter 53, this is the confession of all who believe on Jesus. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. 
He has no form or comeliness that when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Now, you can't see this in our English Bible, but it's very clear grammatically. All of a sudden, the speaker changes again. And now God has the last word. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Amen and amen. So there are three things we will see today. The first I want to point out in this great prophecy, this gospel of Isaiah, is the life of Jesus. Notice how it begins in verse 13 with the word, Behold. This is a word that calls us to attention. I know we have a lot of veterans in our church. If you're in the military and someone who outranks you, someone who is over you, comes in and begins to offer a command, you're a seaman and the admiral calls you to attention, you stop talking. You get your hands out of your pockets. You get still. You pay attention. I'm very involved as a hobby and something that I enjoy in the martial arts, when one of our masters comes onto the floor, when he begins to talk, guess what? Everyone hushes. They stop what they're doing. They divert their attention to the leader. They're being called to attention. It would be disrespectful not to do so. It would be foolhardy not to do so. God is saying here, behold, pay attention to everything I say. These words should not miss you. They are words of life and even death. Behold, my servant. Now, notice the letter S in servant in your Bible. You notice anything different about it? It's capitalized. This is not just any servant. This is the servant of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah has already given three poetic passages, often called songs, about the servant of the Lord. Capital S. This is not just any follower of God. This is his son, the Messiah. This is the fourth servant song where God is prophesying. He is telling us how Jesus and his coming into this world 700 years later will radically change everything about our lives. So what about this servant should we notice? Well, it begins, my servant will deal with prudently, or the English Standard Version translates it, he will act wisely. Now, all of us in this room know, we realize there's a difference between having a lot of knowledge and being a wise person. 
Some people have great book smarts, right? But they can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Wisdom is taking knowledge and being able to apply it and use it in life-transforming ways. This past week, I was on campus at the University of West Florida talking to college students, and I brought up the fact that today, in classrooms of universities around this country, where professors deny the godhood of Jesus and deny the power of the Bible, yet they can't help but study the words of Jesus, whether it's his grand Sermon on the Mount, or whether they cite parables of Jesus, or some of the sayings of Jesus. Like, we can't even get these out of our vocabulary. His wisdom was so great, even those who don't believe on him, by default quote him, not realizing who they're speaking of. I mean, the wisdom of Jesus was amazing. We're told in the Gospels, over and over, people said when they heard Jesus teach, no man has ever spoken like this man. In fact, we're told in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God begins by reminding us, if you lack wisdom, my servant has the answers you need. James says it this way, if you lack wisdom, you can go to God and he will pour out generously the wisdom you need. Liberally, he's going to pour it out for you because of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In fact, in the, the prophecies of Isaiah, and one of them earlier in chapter 9, he's called Wonderful Counselor. So I hope today, as you're being called to attention to this passage, if you're lacking wisdom, if you're looking for God's will for your life, if you're looking for discernment, oh, that you would call on him today, God, I need to hear your voice. I need wisdom. I need you to speak into my life and change me and use me. Well, the next thing we see in verse 14 about Jesus is that many were astonished at you. They were appalled at you. They were horrified at you. It says that his appearance was disfigured more than any man. Why does Jesus' life have this about it? Well, we know the Bible says he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. He was the most loved man and also the most hated man all at the same time. Some people read this and they think, well, this must refer to the fact that Jesus was not good looking. He was not suave, okay? Because if Jesus was a real handsome man, that would mean that people might follow him for his looks instead of his life. And they might follow him for his charm instead of the cross. Well, that's an interesting idea, but I don't think that's really where this prophecy is going. I think it's really talking about his life, and in particular, his work on the cross. In fact, one translation renders the next statement, he was so disfigured, he no longer looked like a man. I feel like this has to be referring to the horrendous physical suffering Jesus endured for us. Think about his sleepless nights on Good Friday as he went through that kangaroo court. Think about the sweating of blood, the betrayal, the stabbing in the back. Think about the cat of nine tails ripped of his robe, wrapped around his back, ripping his flesh off him. Think about the buffeting of his face, the slapping cruelly, the mockery he endured. Think, my friends about how they plaited that crown of thorns deep into his skull. They pierced with nails his hands and feet, the jarring blow of the cross as it descended into the ground, the spear that punctured his side as the blood and water flowed. I read these words, and I think that this is telling us that the life of Jesus would end with him being a shockingly inhuman mass of wounded flesh. That was Good Friday. That's what he did on the cross. In fact, it says his form was more than any of the sons of men. In other words, many people had been crucified before, but what happened to Jesus stands outside of them all. Because if you remember, we're going to talk about this in a minute in more detail, for three hours, darkness was over the world, And what Jesus suffered on the cross was something only he would ever be able to do with his life. As he bore something that our eyes could not see, but all our hearts can feel, as he took our place. If you move forward, 
We go to verse 3, and it continues and says, He's despised and rejected. Now, I think all of us know what it means to have an enemy, to be despised, to be rejected. Now, I'm not just talking about in the dating scene, okay? Not just that kind of rejection. I mean in life. Family members turning their backs on you, friends abandoning you, loved ones, people that you gave so much to, acting like you never meant anything to them at all. If you have felt that kind of sorrow and grief, recognize with me, Jesus endured that in his life and more. In fact, the reality is we are told in Hebrews 4 that he was tempted in all things. I don't care how bad you've been betrayed, how deep your sorrow has been. He went through all of those things yet without ever doing the wrong thing, without ever sinning. Unlike you and me who often respond very wrongly to pain that other people cause us. In fact, Hebrews 5 says that he had loud cries and tears. He suffered so much on our place. He agonized for you as he prayed in John 17. Matthew 26 says, Jesus speaking, my soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Now listen, uh, in the last two years of pandemic, there's been this huge increase in generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks. People have went through depressive disorder left and right. Those are real things. People suffer with them. They struggle with them. Some of us live in cycles of depression and heart hurt. But I want you to understand here what Jesus endured was far more than anything we would face. He was literally broken hearted. He was crushed And listen, much of our sorrow is self-pity. Not all of it. Some of it's medical, some of it's chemical, some of it's inflicted by others. But a lot of it can often be woe is me syndrome, self-pity, feeling sorry for ourselves. Jesus never once felt sorry for himself. His brokenness in heart was for others, for the desperate condition of humanity. He is a man of sorrows so that he can comfort anyone in this room who has experienced genuine sorrow, the loss of a spouse, the broken heart of one who's been betrayed, the pain of not having holidays and celebrations like maybe we used to, things deep-seated from our childhood we've never even talked about, and we definitely have never processed and gotten healed. He went through it all and more. And yet notice it says here, we did not esteem him. How shocking is that? He went through all of this anguish for us in his life. He was rejected, despised, and yet we did not esteem him. In other words, like many in the world today, people say Jesus was a good prophet. He was a moral leader. He was a martyr. He was a wise man. He was a sage. People say he was a sorcerer. Heard all these kinds of things and more. Yet we did not esteem him for who he really is. The Messiah, the Savior of the world. Today, Jesus is a song for drunks. That's what the name of Jesus is. It is a curse word when something goes wrong and you slam your finger in the door. It is a term of derogatory remark. We don't esteem him like we should. We don't value him. We blaspheme his name. Well, that's the life of Jesus, but look in verse 4 at the death of Jesus, please. It says, despite the way others felt about him, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was stricken. He was smitten by God and afflicted. This is an amazing thing. The Bible makes it clear that each one of us are accountable for our own sin. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel says it this way, the sins of the son shouldn't be carried by the father, and the sins of the father shouldn't be carried by his son. In other words, I can't carry your weight, and you can't carry my weight, and I don't get your guilt, and you don't get my guilt, okay? We're two separate people made in the image of God, And yet notice as we in this section of Isaiah 53 are speaking, we're saying he's borne our griefs. He's carried 
our sorrows. It's like all the things we deserve. He's taken this load off our backs and he's placed it on himself. And he's walked down the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem, carrying the cross in our place and suffers in our place. Jesus wept in our place. Sometimes mental pain is far worse than physical pain. Again, some of you in this room have endured trauma, distress. Jesus bore all of that and more. And that's why today the Bible says if you are full of anxiety and worries and fears, you can cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Isn't that beautiful? He cares for you. He's endured it. He's went through it. Now, he was stricken by the slaps and the crown of thorns and the punching and the rod of the Romans. But notice it says here he was also smitten by God. This is so important. The Roman rods were a gentle caressing compared to what happened on the cross for three hours. Matthew 27 takes, it tells us from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was darkness all over the world. And on the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He said these words in Aramaic. He was praying Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The orphans cry, why have you forsaken me, O oh God? He had the legal judicial sentence for our sins placed on him. I read this language and I think of the end of our worship services. At the end of our services, I or Brother Frank pray on you every week a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. This is the antithesis of this. No, his face didn't shine on Jesus. Darkness came upon Jesus. Jesus endured the curse of sin that we deserve. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that the one who would be hanged on a tree is accursed by God. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now, it's important to say here that God has said in this passage that while Jesus bore our place, while he took our curse, while he faced our sorrows and even more, he was my righteous servant. Do you remember reading that? It says it a few times. He is my righteous servant. In other words, he wasn't getting what he deserved. He was getting what you deserve and what I deserve. Isn't that amazing? Everything Jesus endured was what we deserve. In fact, we are told that the man, the Roman governor who gave permission for Jesus to be crucified, washed his hands of it, and he said, I find no guilt in this man. His wife came to him in a dream and said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. You want even a greater testimony? His familiar friend Judas, who for three years lived with Jesus night and day, served with Jesus night and day. The man who would surely want to justify himself, who had betrayed Jesus with 30 pieces of silver. As he, his conscience got the best of him, and he returned that, that silver, he said, I have sinned by betraying what? Innocent blood. Now the reality is, my kids could probably rat me out for a sin I committed this morning trying to get us all here. Some of you had the same battle, but you made it. Good job, okay? And you might have been fighting in the car on the way here, but you got your smile on when you came in at least, right? Here's the thing. Judas had not one thing he could say against Jesus Christ. Perfect man. Perfect God. He was innocent. Verse 5 makes it clear that they now understand why Jesus died. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes, we are healed. And then verse 6, which has been called the John 3, 16 of the Older Testament. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone our own way. But the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. 
It's amazing to me. The truth is, he was wounded for us. He was pierced through for us. Think about the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, they couldn't be in the presence of God. God put a cherubim, an angel there with a flaming sword of judgment, a sword of separation. No more could we walk with God. But at the cross, it was the piercing of Jesus' hands and feet, the piercing of his side that says you don't have to be separated from him anymore. He was wounded so you would have life. He endured the flaming sword of justice so the gates of Eden would be reopened and we could know God and walk with God and love God. And he did it for our transgressions, for you and for me, for our sins. How beautiful is this? What is a transgression? Well, it's not obeying the law of God. It's disobeying God. Like the ninth commandment, have you ever told a lie before? What does that make you? It makes you a liar. Or the eighth commandment, have you ever taken something that doesn't belong to you, stolen before? Come on, you already admitted you're a liar, right? You're a thief. Or the seventh commandment, you should not commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Or you shall not murder. And yet, we're told if you have hatred in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Anyone feeling bad yet? Or you should not take God's name in vain. Use his name as a four-letter filthy curse word. Those are transgressions. We are liars and thieves and blasphemers and adulterers at heart, murderers at heart. That's only a few of the things we've transgressed. He says we are like sheep who have wandered astray. You see, we did it our way instead of God's way. We've wandered off the path God had for us. By the way, being called sheep is not a compliment. I didn't realize this years ago when I started pastoring. But sheep are helpless, defenseless animals. Totally dependent on a shepherd. There are many stories. Because sheep have no common sense. Because their eyesight is poor. Of left to their own, walking down into a stream and drowning. Of following a bale of hay that blows off the side of a cliff and they just keep walking off the cliff following it. There are stories of crows landing on sheep and beginning to literally, not to get too graphic, I know lunch is coming, right? Take out the eyeballs of the sheep and they just, they don't fight back, okay? There are these stories and more of how defenseless they are. In fact, probably the only difference between us and sheep is the fact that we worry about what we're going through. Sheep don't even worry about it. They just let it happen. Yet, he is doing all of this, going through all of this for us sheep who have went our own way. Notice verse 12 says, he was numbered with the transgressors. His whole life was for the sheep, for sinners like you and me. Think for a moment. Jesus is called a glutton. He's calling a friend of sinners, a friend of prostitutes. He is said to be a drunkard. Why? Because he spent his life living with sinners. He didn't do it to leave them the same. He did it to change them forever and give them hope and take their sin away. Isn't that beautiful? Even on the cross of Jesus, think of how he died. On the cross, he took the place. He was in the center of the three crosses. He was in the spot reserved for the worst criminal, Barabbas, who was a murderer, an insurrectionist, a robber. He took the great criminal Barabbas's place, literally, surrounded by two robbers on either side of him. How many of us would say, I'll identify with that prostitute. I'll identify with that murderer. I'll lay my life down for them. Romans says, scarcely will a righteous man die for a good person, much less a sinner. And yet Isaiah is showing us here that's exactly who Jesus would die for. He had to die amongst the worst of sinners so he could forgive the worst of them. 2 Corinthians 5 says it this way, he became sin for us though he knew no sin. In other words, he took our sin on himself on the cross, and we get his righteousness. We get 
No more an enemy of God, now we're a daughter of God, a son of God, adopted into God's family. No more is God angry at us, God loves us. No more are we enemies, now we're in the family. It's a great exchange that happens in this section. You want proof of that? Look at the cross. What does that professional executioner say? Battle-hardened Roman soldier, as he sees Jesus in humility, weak, suffering, that professional Roman executioner says, truly, this was the Son of God. Why would he believe on him? Because God is king, and God is giving this man a new heart and a new life, because that's exactly why Jesus came. Think about the thief next to Jesus. His hands are nailed to the cross. He can't do any good works for Jesus. His feet are nailed to the cross. He can't run any errands for Jesus. But he believes in his heart, and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Saved. His life is changed forever. Isaiah is seeing and saying the confession of everyone who has been lifted up on the shoulders and said, look, this man died for you. That's exactly what's happening here. In verses 7 through 9, we see he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He's cut off from the land of the living. He makes his grave with the wicked and the rich at his death. How shocking is this? Jesus doesn't die a martyr. He lays his life down for us. He said, no one can take my life from me. I lay it down. He's like a sheep being shorn as he suffers and dies. We know that it, it's kind of like he is shorn of his majesty, shorn of his dignity, shorn of his honor, shorn of his glory, shorn of his life. He suffers all of these indignities so you could be made whole and complete. And then again, the details here. He makes his grave with the wicked. That's the two criminals. And with the rich at his death, he gets the new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He is taken to that tomb by the rich Pharisee Nicodemus. I know, it's Easter Sunday. When do we get to the resurrection? Well, you've seen the life of Jesus. You've seen the death of Jesus. Look at the resurrection of Jesus, please, in verses 10 through 12. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, notice this, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. How can that be? If you die, you don't get to see your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren, right? Especially when you die at age 33. You don't get to see your descendants, Isaiah is reminding us here that Jesus would die, but he was not going to stay dead. We live and die, John Stott once said, but Christ died and he lives. The gospel was not in vain. The cross was not in vain. He just borrowed that rich man's tomb for a couple days. That's all. See, when we see this here, we see the fact that Jesus really meant it when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet will he live. Listen, every time I do a funeral, I tremble in fear because I hate death. Death is an enemy. Death is not natural. We weren't meant to die. Sin brings death into this world. And the only reason why I have hope as a minister of the gospel, and the only reason why you have hope is because I know someone who died and rose again. And he has offspring. He has seed. In other words, his death was not in vain. It's still changing lives today. It could change your life today. You could be brought into the family. David said in Psalm 16, prophesying this, that his body would not be abandoned to Sheol, the grave, and that the Holy One, Jesus, would not see corruption. He'd only be there three days, and he would rise again. And he says today, I am he that lives, and I was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And today, he is with us in this place. He is here this morning. 
That first verse we looked at in verse 13 says, He will be exalted. He will be very high. That's his resurrection. That's his glorification. Not only would he die and be in the tomb those three days, but he will leave our sins, our sorrows, our griefs, our failures, our brokenness in the tomb, and he will rise again, and he will change anyone who turns to him. He will be exalted. Death could not keep him. The grave could not hold him from rising again. He will be extolled. He ascends into heaven at the ascension. He will be very high right now. He is in the heavens ruling and reigning in this world, and he will change anyone who looks to the living Jesus. That is the gospel hope we have. I want to lastly make One final statement from verse 12. As God closes out this section, notice the language here. He poured out himself to death. That's in the perfect tense. That's completed. He did that once for all. He was numbered with the transgressors. That's in the perfect tense. He did that once for all. He bore the sin of many. He did that on the cross, never to be repeated once for all. But then this passage ends in verse 12, and it's so beautiful, because it goes from the perfect tense in those three verbs to the imperfect tense. He is making intercession for the transgressors. Right now, Jesus is alive in heaven. He's praying for us. Right now, if you see yourself as a sinner and you feel the weight of your sin and your sorrow and your pain, you can go to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And right now, today is the day of salvation. Right now, he will hear your prayer. Right now, he will reach into your heart like he reached into the heart of the centurion and of that robber on the cross. And he will give you a new heart and he will give you a new life. He died for you, and he will give you new life through his resurrection if you will turn to him. Right now, look, I'm praying, I've been praying all week that God would change lives through the intercession of Jesus and his work in this church this morning, right now. And I assume other people were praying for you to be changed by Jesus Christ right now. Right now. Behold, today is the day. There were a series of tornadoes that caused extensive damage in eastern Ohio and western Pennsylvania some years ago. Actually, over 100 people died in those tornadoes. And I remember reading a news article about this. And prior to the storm, there was a man named David Koska, just a normal guy. He was umpiring a little league game that day. He looked out in Wheatland, Pennsylvania, and he saw a black funnel cloud coming towards where the game was going on. Mr. Costco, with all of his equipment on, ran into the stands because his little niece was up there. And he grabbed his little niece with all his might, and he ran with her down the stands. He he took her to the closest ditch he could find. They got down into the ditch. He covered her body with his body, and he held on into the ground with every ounce of strength he had. And then the tornado arrived and struck. When his little niece looked up, she realized she had survived the moment. But her uncle's body was gone. He had given his life in the deadly storm to save her. If he wanted to save her life, he had to give himself. So it is with Jesus Christ. He gave himself to save my life and to save your life. And today Jesus is alive and well. and He can make you alive in the depths of your heart if you will turn to him and believe on him. Let's pray together.